Hello and welcome everybody to the uh, Fireware Healthcare Day. It's now uh, two o'clock, so let's uh, let's kick off. My name is uh, Charlotte Cotterman. I am the community manager at the Fire Foundation, and I would hereby like to thank you all for joining us today. Now, before I jump into the introduction, I would very briefly like to go over a few things. Um, we ask that all attendees mute themselves and turn off their cameras throughout the presentations just to avoid any connectivity issues. Um, secondly, this is a live event and it will be recorded. So by attending this event, you agree to the recording, which will be made available on the FIRA YouTube channel. So you will be able to revisit this event whenever you like. Lastly, after each presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Um, so you can ask your question in the chat after the presentation, but you can also drop, uh, drop any questions uh, you have uh, throughout the presentations and we will then do our best uh, to make sure that they get addressed. Um, now, for those of you who are not uh, very familiar with us yet, FIRA Foundation is a nonprofit organization that drives the definition uh, through their open source implementation of key open de facto standards that enable the development of portable and interoperable smart solutions in a faster, easier, and affordable way, uh, avoiding vendor lock in scenarios whilst also nourishing a sustainable and innovation driven business ecosystem around it. Now, FIRA is, is known for its ability and speed to address urgent challenges and the needs of society, companies, and uh, public administrations. And the need for ready-to-use solutions based on open source and open standard principles uh, to help automate data sharing continues to grow rapidly. And, and this has once again become very evident during the current COVID-19 pandemic. And we see that more and more sharing tools are becoming available driven by open source principles, uh, allowing relevant parties to access existing solutions, as well as build on top of uh, widely available off the shelf solutions. And uh, in turn, present circumstances uh, are also a good test case for data safety and cybersecurity, especially when handling uh, health and personal data. So this event will feature outstanding keynote speeches uh, and uh, specialist speeches from experts in the field, as well as real life use cases coming from from various countries highlighting uh, just how health authorities and other relevant parties can leverage open source technologies uh, to better track patients, to contain viruses, uh, and to build a robust healthcare system. So um, once again, a warm welcome to today's Healthcare Day. I would now like to introduce you all uh, very quickly to uh, today's fantastic lineup. So today we welcome Lee Randall, uh, Dr. Quig Vo Reinhardt, Alberto Sanna, Hector Dominguez, Lanfranco Marasso, Hans-Peter Knaust, and from the FIRA Foundation, Christina Brandstetter and Juanjo Hierro. And in addition, I would also like to take uh, this opportunity to thank our media partners, Business Reporter, Compass List, EU Observer, and Zoom Global Cities for their uh, tremendous support in disseminating this event. Now, I would, I would like to introduce you all to the person who will be guiding you through today's virtual event, namely Lanfranco Marasso. Lanfranco has a proven track record in IT projects and innovation in the public sector. And after completing his engineering degree at the University of Genova, he completed his PhD in process engineering at the Polytechnic University of Milan. He's currently the Digital Enabler Program Director and Digital Strategist at Engineering. And in addition, he has also played an active role in several EU initiatives on software and services for the public sector. He has also published several articles and books on process and project management, new technology applications, and innovation in the public sector and uh, smart cities. So uh, we welcome Lanfranco. Lanfranco, thank you for being with us today. And uh, I would now like to hand over the mic to you. Thank you, uh, Charlotte. Thank you to the Fireware Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first Fireware Health Care Day. Uh, this is a great opportunity we have today to share a number of experiences uh, which are uh, scattered within the, the Fireware community. And uh, of course, in the background, we have the critical role of open source, which is in the title of the event today. And uh, we need to have in mind also the open, uh, open standards uh, on, uh, on the way to make secure and robust our healthcare system. We are living a nightmare. Since the last six months, we used to say our world is changing and uh, we are going to a new, uh, a new world. And, and this is not easy, but um, I think we, we need to change the things from a, num a number of different perspectives. But basically, 
uh, the healthcare is in the middle, mainly in the, in the last recent weeks, where in a way the COVID-19 is going up and we need to react promptly. Having in mind the experience uh, we had in the last months in our country. So today we have a very exciting agenda. And um, as, I, as I told before by uh, Charlotte, uh, we have uh, two keynote speakers um, where we, we expect to receive an overview about uh, what is the state of the art in applying technology like open source and, uh, and, uh, and fireware to the health domain. Then uh, we will have three specialists uh, providing us uh, speeches on uh, some specific uh, aspects. And then we will have two use cases where we try to understand uh, what happened in, uh, within the, the community. And I personally tell you the story, what we did in, uh, in Italy. So I changed my hat from the moderator to the, to the speaker. But um, coming back, we, we have the, the, the time and we have a number of uh, speakers during the day. So I, I leave you the floor introducing uh, one by one. And um, um, when we last five minutes, uh, I try to give you a sign in a way, uh, because uh, we need to, to keep five minutes in the end of your presentation for Q&A for the audience. And uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can put your question on, uh, on the chat and uh, we'll move the question to the, to the speakers. Let, let me introduce the first speaker, Lee Randall. Are you there? I am. Yeah. I am. Yes, indeed. Okay. I'm going to go. Hi. Can okay. you hear me? Very good. So great, uh, Lee. Thank you. Uh, your speech today is about uh, open source platform for digital enabler in, in healthcare, which is uh, uh, very important uh, um, under the umbrella of the title of this uh, Fire day today. Lee is a key account manager at NHS at the Red Hat and is improving uh, the NHS and also part uh, in the project in the public sector using Red Hat open source solution. So Lee, the floor is your. I'll switch on my off my camera and mic and I switch on my timer. Thank you. Lovely. Uh, thank you, Lanfranco. Lovely introduction. Um, I. Uh, for my part today will be just taking us on a very high level um, overview of how open source uh, platforms um, are the key to digital enablement in healthcare as the title slide says. Okay so here we go um, and if those of you are familiar with Fireware and, and Red Hat perhaps um, maybe not um, there's been a lot of talk um, in, in our community around smart cities um, and health and social care and, and the joining up of a lot of citizen services. So let's just start with um, what we see in, in the UK here. Uh, this isn't a city, although it looks like a city, it's the size of a city, it's actually a very large hospital group over in the east of England at um, Cambridge University Hospital. Um, it's a couple of miles wide and, um, and takes forever to get from one side to the other. It's actually grown since this photograph appeared. Um, and a, a, a hospital of this size brings with it uh, the same sort of challenges we see in, in, our, in our folks looking after our cities. They have their own waste management systems to contend with. They've got their own tra in transport infrastructure. They house loads of, of, of nurses and junior doctors, etc. They have their own housing department. It's just, it's just a behemoth of, of an organization. And they still have to integrate somehow into the citizen services that the rest of the um, area has to cover. Yes, so that's, that's what I was referring to. As you can see, it's a behemoth of an organization. And we see um, healthcare organizations across the UK, across Europe, and, and even across the Americas, certainly our colleagues in North America, they see a coming together of hospital groups and, a, and an amalgamation. And that brings challenges which some of our colleagues will be touching on later, but I'll touch on very briefly in just a moment. So let's look at where we are, previous versus future. And some would argue that many healthcare organizations we talk to are very much stuck on the previous and we'll touch on what that looks like right now. So the previous state of many hospital groups was lots of siloed information, minimal data sharing. Uh, the, um, in, if you're in the US or in a private healthcare system, it's a provider and claim centric approach. Uh, there was little or no push for collaboration. The IP of the patient belonged to the hospital. Um, very little IT change that we saw, business as usual, 
was and to a greater extent still is king and we see monolithic infrastructure in place and locked in big um, uh, big expensive systems the current state as a lot of analysts would have us believe is that there's more uh, by way of meaningful use requirements that that is the data is, um, is is more shareable and more meaningful we're seeing large electronic medical record systems in place uh, the likes of Epic and Cerna, Lorenzo, all scripts and so on, um, big large EMRs. We're seeing more value-based care, certainly in, amongst the private sector. Population health management has become has come to the fore. Here in the UK, the Department of Health has uh, only recently become the Department of Health and Social Care. So there's there's more joined up thinking around around the patient and their and their journey through healthcare. That has led to a data explosion, especially as we start to look at more digitally enabled services or digitizing old um, records, etc. Interoperability is an absolute requirement now, and we're seeing some use of cloud or, or more, some use of modern technology. The future state and, uh, and the end goal for a lot of uh, hospital groups would be to have patient centric care. Um, a social care um, collaboration I just touched upon already um, and that collaboration not just with social care but with other organizations outside of, of healthcare where there may be uh, touch points um, patient wants access to self-management tools we're seeing that COVID has been a driver for some of those types of changes and enablement and um, digital healthcare telemedicine wearables etc there's more and more data sources now to contend with that can help the patients uh, journey through life but also can, can cause problems about how we share this and um, and genomics um, here in the UK uh, in the last couple of years we've cracked the 100,000 genome project and we're pushing for a, the 1 million genome project and, and the end result of that will be uh, the ability to be able to have more predictive um, analytics around um, patients their, their geography um, their personal lifestyle and and their their makeup their DNA and I would argue that here in the UK a lot of hospital groups we talk to are still stuck in what what the analysts refer to as the previous state and it's something perhaps that the uh, the panel can discuss at some point this afternoon or this morning depending on what part of the world you're in so I'm just moving on to sort of where we're at now um, we see silos of information everywhere and it's something that fireware have been talking about on, on some of their more recent um, conferences we see applications and services being bought into the hospital uh, we're seeing hospital groups going out and buying ad hoc we're seeing departments within hospitals doing shadow it i know of a radiology department here in the uk at a particular hospital where they have their own it team um, and constantly clinicians will go out and find the best latest um, innovative software and buy it and then expect it to, to, to just fit into what they've already got and that becomes a problem as those silos grow we have 500 plus applications in an average hospital i know hospitals with over a thousand applications and services so what becomes more important is that middle and bottom layer the platforms that we put these on the clinician should still be free to make those choices of the best services available and the more innovative services yet uh, the IT departments and, 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 the, and the business management within the hospitals need to have a way of supporting that desire. And that brings us on to that, that infrastructure layer, that technology infrastructure, is the key that will support and hold up the needs of the healthcare professional and the demands of the patient. Uh, in, in the UK, we have a national health service, the NHS, which, which was referenced um, in my introduction. Uh, and of course, with both of those um, patient record systems and everything else going on, there's a whole heap of guidelines from government. There's, there's government legislation um, restriction and all sorts of, of, of issues around that. So technology has to try and balance all these needs. And in fact, it needs to become the foundation to deliver both of these um, facets. So. Uh, I've touched upon the patient need and the clin clinician need there. So just four simple needs, very easy, right? If if only. So the patient, what do they want? They want access and control of their own records. Right now, most hospital groups I know um, have the records in, in in their own systems, and that's it. And even sharing it with the doctor is a is a problem. 
So most of my colleagues I know, if, they, if you ask them when was the last time they had a tetanus jab or you know, what was their, their medical history, they'd, they'd, they'd struggle to recollect it all, let alone share it with, with someone in a, in a meaningful environment. So access and control of your own records becomes incredibly important, I think, for the patient. They want to be able to choose the service that they're getting. They want to be able to have physio maybe closer to where they work rather than just having to rely on a letter coming through the post saying you have to be at this clinic at this time. Um, it's not efficient for the, uh, for the patient. And I'm sure, you know, there, there's got to be ways of, of improving that, how that works. As I touched on, COVID-19 has actually in, enhanced or, or accelerated the telehealth and video diagnostic um, uh, that, that we're seeing. That, that, the, the public here in the UK have started to embrace the, the idea of, of video diagnostics. I think any fear that they had, I think, has, has diminished. I think it's been proven to be more effective, more efficient. And last thing on here is self-service health. And I touched on it just very briefly a moment ago. Um, the simple example would be prescriptions, right? So right now, if you have a, uh, an ongoing medical condition, perhaps you've got a, a heart condition, you need to take regular uh, medicine, perhaps for the rest of your life. What would happen is you would have to make an appointment with your doctor. You'd go see your doctor, they'd write a prescription. You might even actually see them. You might just have to go to the clinic to collect the prescription. Um, and right now that would involve standing outside in a queue waiting to get into the clinic because of COVID restrictions. Um, and then you'd eventually get your prescription. Then you'd have to go probably stand outside the chemist, the pharmacist, uh, and stand in line and eventually get your, get your medicine. And this is an ongoing repeat prescription. Surely it must be easier to have self-service in there somewhere where you could go request the, uh, the prescription and then order online and get it delivered. It, it, it shouldn't be that difficult. And for healthcare professionals, they want follow me applications and data. It's too difficult right now for a, your average healthcare professional to access the information they need where they need it. Rapid logon and single sign-on continues to be a problem. It can take two, three minutes, maybe longer, to log into a system um, if they have to move from one part of the hospital to the other. And let alone the 20 or 30 applications that they have that they have to remember passwords for. Um, and it's not joined up. And, and, it, and it causes a lot of pain and a lot of pressure on frontline emergency services and clinicians. And they ha they're, they're, they're breaking uh, rules. They're borrowing logons from their colleagues who've got access to the information they need, or they're using a shared logon on a ward because it's the only way to, to effectively get to that information quickly. And they want to bring their own devices. Quite a lot of clinicians are working from more than one hospital. They move between their own clinic and, and different hospitals. So to bring their own device would be, be nirvana for, for many of them because a hospital issues a device, it won't work in another hospital. So, so they're meant to carry three devices around. It just doesn't, it just doesn't work properly. And work from anywhere or follow me desktop. If you're, a, 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 say, a midwife working in the community, you want to be able to log on from perhaps the patient's home address to update their records. Instead of having to go around, see your, see your patients and then do a couple of hours additional work at the end of the day, surely more efficient um, to work from, be able to work from anywhere. So just four simple needs. And that's the challenge, I think, for, for all of us to try and help our, our clinicians solve these problems. So where does open source fit into all of this? Well, we know, we know for a fact from working with our, our multitude of customers in government, in healthcare, the Fortune 500 and, and so on, that open source and open standards deliver greater security and cyber safety. Um, how? Because the, well, just by um, de facto, open source has far more people looking at code, has far more people finding those, those um, vulnerabilities, and therefore, the compliance becomes easier to adhere to. It's easier to patch and maintain open source operating systems. It's been proven time and again. Interoperability. Uh, and my colleagues at Fireware, this is, this is their bag, and hopefully you'll be hearing a bit more about this today. Interoperability that will mean that all those silos that you saw just, just on a few slides back, all those applications and services start to become joined up. And that means that patient contact can, can, can increase, improve, and accelerate. We can share that information very quickly uh, and, and increase that patient contact. Resilience. 
So business continuity is a, a big challenge. Only recently here in the UK, we had a city-wide outage in power. And one of our major hospital groups, not far from where I live actually, um, lost both their data centers during that period of time and, and, and had to send patients to other outside the city. So they've, um, they're looking at uh, doing something really radical, moving everything to, to cloud. I don't believe that's the right strategy. I think you need to have a more resilient nature where you can move applications and services around to the right place at the right time and, and move them to a cloud provider and back on premise based on that continuity uh, at the time. You know, is there an outage, move it to the cloud. If there's not, keep it on prem, do what's right for the, for the hospital. Uh, a culture change. Now, we know open source um, drives um, a, a, a different culture and a different mindset. Um, and I'll touch on culture change in just a moment. But culture change effectively will help drive innovation. And innovation will effectively drive improved patient outcomes. And open source, well, the soft, there's no license cost. So immediately there's a, a cost reduction. Um, uh, Red Hat, for example, we charge just for supporting uh, enterprise um, grade support for open source projects. So that means more budget for healthcare services. And that one's so important, we thought we'd put it in there twice. Um, so I mentioned culture change. Open source leads to an open organization. Um, in fact, we, we actually wrote a book on it. Well, our previous um, CEO, Jim Whitehurst, wrote a book called The Open Organization. I highly recommend it. Um, but let's go back to this conventional organization. And this is what I see at probably, well, every single hospital I walk into, it, every single healthcare organization is a top down conventional organization. Command and control, central planning. And effectively, that means that the innovation is supposed to start from the top. But the people doing the work on the front line are the ones that know what needs to happen. So we don't believe that this is the right way. A few, minute, few minutes, please. Thanks, very much. Thanks, Anne Franco. I've only got one more to go after this. You'll be pleased to know. Um, the open organization has a bottom up uh, meritocracy approach, which means you get more innovation driven from the people at the front line. Um, and again, I, I believe open source, at least for an open organization, leads to culture change, which drives innovation. And eventually, that gives us the digital transformation we need to support those life events. No pun intended, but from cradle to grave, we want to know that we can access and get the best healthcare available at all those different touch points throughout our lives. So I've got my final slide is three, three um, hopefully thought provoking statements that I want to make. Platforms that are open source by design are future proofed and agile in nature. Data that is shareable is immediately usable. And if it's not interoperable, then why are you doing it? Thank you very much. And I'll pass back to Charlotte and then Franco. So thank you, Lee. Thank you for your very interesting um, presentation. There is a question from Andrew you can, uh, you can find in the chat, which is not just related to uh, open source uh, um, technology, but is related to telehealth. And uh, particularly in this specific moment of uh, COVID. If you if you want to give an answer to Andrew, yeah. really, you're let right. me have a look at the um, let me have a look at the question. So the less fear using telehealth, partially due to the fact that fear of COVID is higher than fear of telehealth. Um, I'm I'm not so sure. I think there might have been a fear beforehand. I don't know if the fear of COVID supersedes the fear of telehealth. I certainly have seen firsthand in my own family um, a a number of video consultations when. Perhaps it's not such a serious condition. I think it's 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 far more efficient, and I think the the fear of, uh, you know, possibly fifty percent or more of, of of calls to a GP surgery or appointments probably aren't that urgent. If it was, you'd go to the hospital. So I think that people in, in, embrace being given the opportunity to try it. I suppose uh, 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 would embrace it more. And if it's more efficient and gives more time back to the clinician. And just as importantly, more time back to the to the to the patient. You know, they don't have to go queue and and try and get that appointment. That that's that, you know that's my own personal opinion, but I believe I believe it. I believe that people um, will not have a fear of telehealth unless it's something that's you know that they're really worried about. In which case, you can't be face to face consultation. I I agree. So thank you, uh, Lee. I have a question for you related to the open source. Uh, 
a solution for, uh, for the healthcare. You mentioned several, and you touched several hot points, uh, security and safety, interoperability and budget. And uh, of course, we need to increase the quality of our uh, health uh, information system. But uh, from your perspective as a Red Hat, uh, do you think when the uh, public and private sector, health sector, uh, is ready for the adoption of open source solution and in which way the procurement can push the, the, this adoption? Okay, so good question, Juan Franco. Yes, um, uh, the interesting thing is we see from the private sector healthcare uh, a, a massive adoption. And these are organizations that perhaps think more like a business. Um, thankfully, they also think very nicely like a healthcare organization now due to a lot of uh, legislation that's been passed in the US, for example. But uh, my colleagues in, in, in North America have had great success working with, um, with a number of healthcare agencies. You can find them on our website in our healthcare section. There's a number of very good case studies. Um, here in Europe, we've had uh, a, a, a very different splattering of engagement um, and it's driven perhaps by by technology needs rather than the cultural or open source needs i think we do struggle here in europe to get that message across land franco you're absolutely right to ask that question are, are they ready for it they should be because we know what we can do it's it's trying to get to the right people who perhaps don't fear um, what open source is and i can give a very real world example not so long ago we met with some senior people from here at the healthcare organizations in the UK, the NHS. And uh, it was an open source evening. It was at a famous hospital, uh, Great Ormond Street Hospital here in London. And um, they still had to address the idea of open source, not being two guys in a closet making some code, right? Um, and, and that's still the prevailing attitude amongst a lot of senior decision makers in healthcare. And that needs to change. And I think, you know, maybe the more of these we do, the more we can, you know, we can challenge those attitudes and challenge is what we need to do, Lan Franco. Okay, thank you, Lee, for your speech. And now we move from the UK to the Switzerland with the second keynote speaker. And uh, the, also this title, after the uh, open source platform, now we move to talk about the unlock the value of the data in health. So ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to P. Uh, Ro Reynard uh, with um, her presentation. He is the Chief Data Officer and Co-Founder of uh, HIT Foundation. She's also Director of R&D and uh, Board Member of Sentiva Health. But since we are talking about the value of data in blockchain, she has been voted as the most influential woman in blockchain Europe in 2018. So Key, the floor is yours for 15 minutes, leaving a few minutes in the end for the Q&A. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Wee Royhart, uh, currently the CDO and co-founder of Pit Foundation, and also the uh, head of R&D of Sentiva House. These are the platform for um, with the blockchain technologies base to foster the access to healthcare data. And uh, today I would like to focus on how blockchain can foster to the access of health data and uh, what are we doing at Sentiva Health. Let me start with the real story. Uh, this one patient in Vietnam with really rare disease means rare means in total in the whole world we have like 10,000 cases of patients with this disease. And until the point we got this boy um, to to got detected and to know what kind of disease he are he had, um, it's too late. So and he just become blind forever in his life, which can be safe if he live in another country. So here we see the point of a person with for some rare disease, uh, they would like to participate in any any research. Or, uh, and they have brought them with the treatment uh, because they don't know, they don't even know what kind of disease they have. Or even in this case, the cost to access the healthcare and the treatment system. On the other hand, um, back then, 10 years ago, I contacted so many hospital and university and research institute that all of them in this area of disease, they are so desperate to reach out to the people 
to get um, to get enough patient and enough data to do research on the um, on the disease. So, as you see, um, there are many cases people are really would like to participate in, in, in research and they're willing to share, they have data for research. But overall, if we are in, in Europe or in the USA or in many other countries, uh, when we ask, like, would you like to share your health data? Most of us just knock the head, like, nah, yeah, and nah, if you are in Germany, like, you have, yeah, and nah, so you and the yellow team, or you are in the blue team, and normally we are in the blue team that, yeah, I don't really want to share. Mm. And the second question is currently, are you happy with the current health data protection? For example, here in um, Europe, we have GDPR. So yeah or no or something in between means yeah. Um, yeah, there is the protection, there's the law regulation in different countries, but yeah, it could be better because I'm okay to participate in research, I'm okay to share my data, but I don't know where it's going, what it's used for, who's using it, and I have no incentive. And as you see, the current challenge is uh, patient, they really reluctant to participate in research because they don't have the incentive. And the rare disease patients have huge incentive here, but normally people don't really have incentive to share the data. They're really concerned about the data privacy and security. They have limited time and anonymity and also data ownership. But on the other hand, the, the, the researcher are the one who really need data. They, they have problem of access to patient pool and incentivize patients to participate in research. So um, there are many, many applications, technology applications to help to resolve this problem. Blockchain is one of them and how um, blockchain can foster the access to patients. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the topic, it's really brief uh, introduction because there is a lot, uh, I would like to talk more about the application itself. So it's just a open database, decentralized public permission or per, uh, information and immutable record of transaction. Means whatever is on blockchain is on chain, is stay there forever. You cannot change it and you cannot go back. And normally, a blockchain is executed with a smart contract. Uh, Ethereum is one of the most famous one, but we have blockchain version 2.0, 3.0, and so on with, with the smart contract, but business logic um, remain off-chain. Smart contract is more or less the business contract, but digitalized and is define the future action once the the requirement is met. So one of the really uh, important features of blockchain is hashing. And we use really a lot in, in house data and in data privacy. Um, for example, we have here is the text and then we use the hash function SHA256 and then you see the hash here. So normally um, the, the patient or the people identity in the data and when we do the transaction on the blockchain on of this is hash or uh, with the cryptographic signature so that we remain anonymous and the data uh, has this privacy so and in the healthcare sector normally they have in four different areas of application um, the financial and insurance and record to uh, avoid the, the fraud, the claims, or the supply chain management is one of the most uh, applicable uh, application of blockchain in healthcare. Um, the other part is digital identity management is really early on, um, even though there's not so many applications currently on this area, I mean, as the execution level, not as the ideation. And then the, the other part is the clin clinical research and data access, data monetization. 
So in the middle, you see Fortman Lecture. It's a consortium of many top leaders of Fortma, like Brush, Novartis, Johnson & Johnson, and many others. Um, they form the consortium to have variety, uh, various applications of blockchain in healthcare. Means they start to notice that, okay, it, it's time to really innovate and disrupt the healthcare industry that they cannot stay behind anymore. And one of the examples I present here is uh, from Centiva Health, that how we, with the blockchain technology, can foster the access to patients. So our solution is the a decentralized patient access solution, means we are the matchmaker, like Airbnb, the people who need the house and the people who have the house can go on the, on the platform and, and they vouch each other. So here, the people who need the data, for example, for research, like researcher, former insurance, and so on, they post and they need this kind of specific data, and the people who's the owner of data is ourselves, we can accept it or not. And um, different uh, with the other application, there's no data storage on uh, our platform and um, this with the blockchain back so we have instant digital access transfer and payment for incentive uh, what is incentive here the incentive is we know to whom we share the data where's going and we can withdraw when is uh, when we disagree to and the exchange of the data happen in the fair secure and transparent manner um, and normally with the with the blockchain technology so we ensure the uniqueness of the replies via the digital signature is you know, with crypto graphic signature here and the incentives means in a way that every time every person um, share their data uh, healthy or not or with disease and so on they got the digital health point in return similar to the way you go with the with the airlines the more you fly the more point you have and in the end you can convert these airline miles to upgrade to the business um, level or to to redeem in in the shop and so on so we do similar things in healthcare sector means everything you exchange you got the point in the end you can exchange to medical or non-medical services and that's the on the platform we have three different uh, applications and the, the the most used one is the Centre for Life uh, it's on the iOS and also Android already um, this is the real world data to help the organization and people to collect the house world data uh, real world data sorry and Sentiva 360 uh, specifically really focus on COVID or population health data where we really need to focus on the mass um, collection of the population health data to drive fast decision making especially in COVID time and also Sentiva BAS is the registry solution for a digital health certificate how, did, how does it happen here? Uh, you can see the loop from the, the top at, um, from the top right. First, a organization, for example, researcher, medtech, former healthcare, insurance, and so on. They can ask um, and filter the criteria and reward the offer uh, that this kind of specific people we are looking for post it on blockchain and the matching happen on the apps. Uh, itself and only the, the people who match to the criteria and requirement will will be shown to the surveys or to the request they accept or deny and then it goes to the other data response itself so just just to be clear here the data is not on blockchain and the transaction when it happened when the the patient agreed to participate then Every time they send something, then we have the hash and we can monitor the hash. For example, here we use RedCap 
It's really famous um, consortium for researchers on around the world. And every time patient answer the survey, they will have something in return. Um, and then they pay out in the end of the day, uh, sorry, in the end of the, the survey, they can have some point and then they can reward it in different services. So the application as um, shown before is the real world data uh, collection um, between different, the, the one who need the data and the one who have the data. Uh, and normally we apply in the treatment monitoring and treatment adhering that the people and the researcher or the hospital really would like to encourage the patient to follow up the treatment and then we use it as the incentive for the patient to do the adhering program. Yeah, and as you see here, so people are really anonymous and other application is population health data. Also, some similar application that you can monitor the stress, spread of the disease and limit the transmission of the disease. Um, so example of the rare disease, as I say in the beginning, that okay, is specifically we have this application in rare disease. Uh, so one of the examples is the application of the TB adhering together with the WHO that every time patient adhering to the program, they can get the point uh, in return and in the end of the program, they get the examination, clinical examination for free. And we have Brady disease project with the uh, farmers here in Switzerland and in Europe. And yeah, thank you very much. You can see the app on, on either smart, uh, on either Android or iOS and looking forward for the question. So thank you so much, Key, for your very interesting uh, presentation. With your keynote, you introduce us in a very um, great uh, um, world to be to be explored. There is a question for Gustavo from the audience, in the is asking you, have you test other distributed ledgers like uh, IOTA or Edera or SD Chain that can improve? scalability of blockchain limitations yeah so in our platform uh this is really interesting uh, question though um in our platform we use name blockchain and the reason why we use name blockchain without the other application um because of the scale scalability also because of the the smart contract here is not really the, the the smart contract but it's the digital contract which the business logic remain off chain so for other um dlt or other like ethereum that you have smart contract and everything remain on chain means uh, once if you have errors or anything happen wrong in the smart contract is is one one way um one way ticket so you cannot go back but with name blockchain you can go back and and fix the the logic itself and it's especially suitable for healthcare sector because of the health data itself i hope i answered the question but yeah okay. of course uh, there is these are uh, many other organizations use dlt also but also the cost is cost. Oh, okay, thank you so much. I have a last question. Um, uh, you mentioned that the uh, Heat Foundation provided a blockchain-based marketplace for healthcare data. And you mentioned several times the, your presentation, the data monetization. Uh, the question is, is the monetization of these data just related to rewards uh, for the patient? And the other question is, if you're planning some business development or some uh, extending for the platform to the public administration side. Yeah, thank you. For the first one, um, the, the monetiz monetization only for the patient or not? It does a question. Um, yeah, so, so the, uh, yes, the so answer. If uh, the monetization of this data is um, can be related to rewards the patients, so in a way we can give back to the patient um, something in, uh, in your view. It's exactly the point that 
we reward to the patient or to be to be precise we reward to the the people means the owner of the health data so people and the patient are in the center of care because the problem now a day is our data being used without our consent and without any payment that we just got used we like data donor to every every big organization and that's why we insist to make sure that people who owe the data have to get something in reward and and most of the reward go to the patient in some cases that it also go to the organization like the healthcare provider for example if it's the, the data from the hospital means the hospital have to approve that okay this patient from my hospital then they also get some reward. And the answer to the second question is yes. Okay, so thank you so much. We are perfectly in time. Thank you for that. And let me now move to the second part of the this uh, five day, which is the part related to the specialist speech. And the first speaker is the Alberto Sanna, um, and his speech is uh, health and well-being in the social technical ecosystem. So Alberto is a graduated engineer at Polytechnic of Milan. He is the director of the Center of Advanced Technology in Health and Wellbeing and coordinates since a long time a number of projects in the European Framework Program. He's also uh, active in academic teaching uh, as, a, as a professor in information technology, design and medicine courses. So um, the floor is yours, Alberto, and 15 minutes plus few minutes for the question and give you a sign in the end. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Franco, and I uh, hope that uh, you can hear me and you can see my first slide. Perfect. Okay. So this will be a very quick, uh, uh, a very quick uh, travel through uh, a number of, uh, of uh, projects that we have done that demonstrate the feasibility of the approach we are pursuing since more than 20 years uh, within uh, uh, within uh, the um, European environment of research and development and the activity that we are doing for business development and technology transfer. So Sara Faele Hospital, uh, which uh, is, a, is a big hospital, which is part of a much bigger healthcare, private healthcare group that you see here, which is more than 18 hospitals that are uh, uh, all around the Lombardia region in uh, in, in Italy, and what you see on, on the right is a bird's eye view of the campus, which is uh, an entire smart city with all uh, the uh, components uh, that you can of, uh, of, uh, of an ecosystem that you find in the entire system that I will uh, list uh, uh, very quickly. So we have uh, a big area with 3,000 square meters uh, for shops uh, with a supermarket like Carrefour, Mondadori bookstores, uh, general insurance, you name it, uh, we have it uh, in our mall. We have a private metro which is connected the public system to our, our premises. We have an energy plant that is feeding uh, from, uh, uh, from a short distance, uh, much less than uh, 500 meters, uh, all the energy need of this smart city. We have a big sports facility, we have a, a, a 250 room hotel, we have a gigantic area for parking, we have an hospital indeed, we have a big research center with more than, uh, uh, than 700 sorry, um, a researcher working full time on basic research. And uh, uh, as an average, uh, we have more than 5,000 employees. So every day in these premises with other, many other more, let's say, features, uh, we have uh, 25,000 people. Uh, this is number. These are numbers before COVID. Now in these days, uh, we are seeing basically those numbers coming coming back. And by the way, now we are opening a brand new building that has been built in these last uh, uh, in these last uh, years uh, that will be improve our capacity and our attractivity. So this is an ecosystem. Within this an ecosystem, our my the research center I am director of is this one, research center of advanced technology in health and well-being that address the issue or how to sustain healthier, greener and fairer individual and collective behaviors. And we have three research lines that you see here, Hospital of the Future, Life of the Future and City of the Future, which are all run in parallel and, and intertwined uh, one each other. 
because it's impossible to focus only on one part of the ecosystem if you want to have an overall change of, uh, of well-being at the global uh, at the public level. How we do this? We do this through research projects. These are uh, uh, the, the public one, at least, because the private one with the industrial contract are not public by definition. And most of them would say more than 80% uh, of, of those bubbles that you see here are European projects that has been uh, uh, deployed, uh, de developed and deployed in the last uh, 15 years uh, in San Rafaele, just to make uh, some numbers uh, in the Horizon uh, framework. Uh, uh, we recently add two uh, this summer to our 15 already uh, already awarded. So in total, there are 17 that are they are covering all all possible areas from energy to automotive uh, to healthcare for the zero to uh, smart life and smart city, as I say. So I give you some practical example with pictures because I have a small amount of time, but I want to convey you the message of concreteness and feasibility of what we have done with this very, uh, very um, diverse approach in a very complex ecosystem with a dual die, let's say, methodology. So we started from what we call LKR for the zero with a smart trolley and smart IoT for the healthcare process, robotics in the lab, surgical robotics, uh, connected ambulance with the 5G, uh, with 5G platform, uh, social and cognitive uh, robotics in different areas and domains. You see in the picture, this is the new building that we are uh, developing uh, that is uh, future proof. So it's uh, designed to be consistent uh, with the evolution of the demand of uh, mobile robotics, IoT, uh, that uh, uh, in the next decades, in the next years and decades, will uh, be uh, uh, more and more deployed to enhance the process. So we design real estate to be future proof. And uh, we have the proof of that, or we have a test bed of that. Uh, these are other examples. These are the public information, the information that are public on our 5G project that is uh, here in Milan in partnership with the Vodafone and other partners that you see here listed. Once again, the 5G connected ambulance and the, the one that you see on the left is uh, probably the first, uh, at least in Italy and in Europe, I don't know, in other parts of the world, tele-surgery done with 5G, where the our surgeon was uh, manipulating, uh, using the manipulator in the Vodafone village and the um, fake cooperation we did on uh, obviously on a synthetic uh, larynx uh, has been performed in our labs uh, in, in our uh, department uh, surgery department in Sarafaele at 11 kilometers distance and that was a very a very challenging uh, bidirectional uh, uh, um, uh, study in order to understand feasibility and the validity of almost zero latency with a high uh, with high with the high stakes. So this is to give you an example of the smart hospital and to give you an example of the smart life. Why we focus on smart life? Basically, because uh, our world is aging, uh, diet and physical activity are, uh, are uh, a public health priority, as you can see here. So what we do, we are working for designing uh, uh, age-friendly uh, services and systems, and we're working to implement a, a better diet and improve physical activity but not only at the life level, at the personal life level, but also at the smart city level, because most of the population worldwide and above all in Europe is living in Europe, in urban environments. So we cannot just design for individual, just uh, uh, thinking that they are floating in a non-interactive uh, non space. So that's why we are also addressing smart city. And obviously the, the technology is coming towards us because Internet of Medical Things in general, or Internet of Things in general, and 5G are uh, for sure enablers of all these uh, vision. So I give you some now some these uh, some practical example with pictures of what we have done, okay? And the pipeline, the rich pipeline that we are spin-offing with technology transfer and business development. Uh, uh, agreement uh, with uh, with companies on the business side and with uh, partners uh, in uh, Horizon Project uh, uh, Horizon 2020 or Horizon the incoming Horizon Europe uh, uh, project uh, uh, at the public research level. So the key point here is uh, that uh, people uh, individual is con totally confused 
when they have to take informed decision in different uh, contexts. And what we do here is we recognize that most of the information are available and accessible, but accessible not to the individual. That uh, if you make a query, you are basically bombarded by profile and targeted uh, uh, um, uh, answer that are not really intended to maximize your interest, are intended to maximize the interest of other stakeholders. So what we do is that uh, we uh, start from the healthcare record, we integrate uh, several other features, and we integrate and collect data that we call uh, from, from uh, basically hardware and software wearable sensor or IoT in general, that we call uh, behavioromics and exposomics to cope with the genomics. And here we come with uh, a, a accurate profile that uh, is uh, at the end of the day a owned database by the consumer the individual the patient as you can like and so the query here is addressed on vice versa it is not a push uh, a push mechanism is a pull mechanism where uh, information are requested to understand how much products and services are tailored for optimizing some well-being criteria of the individual in daily life. Obviously, uh, privacy is a major concern and a major, uh, uh, and a major challenge that we have to face in a cloud uh, environment like this. We did it uh, at the beginning uh, uh, for following up the behavior of adherence and the consumption of medication at home with a smart cabinet. We did it uh, in several other domains that you see are listed with small pictures that are basically are one frame from a pilot that comes out from uh, one or more use cases deployed in our smart city in the bubbles of the European project or the uh, or other type of projects that were publicly, uh, let's say, uh, the, in that were the, the chance of publicly disclosed. So we have done a huge amount of things of entertainment, so educating kids to understand uh, the basics so they can take informed decision and they can bias their family and their friends on this informed decision of healthy, green, and, and socially responsible, how to promote and motivate on a personal level on, on doing more physical activity, and the same we did on, on food at the choice level at the supermarket, at the consumption level at home, and at the consumption level at the cafeteria. So here you have some very basic example of what happens. Our logo uh, it becoming, is becoming green, yellow, red, uh, according to what is the impact in your well-being dimension, holistic well-being dimension, as uh, decided by the trusted third party, which in this case is, uh, the, is uh, generated by the hospital uh, engine on maybe a choice of uh, a food uh, of, of yours. Uh, the same we did, as you see, for vending machine, for uh, cafeteria, and for cooking at home, and so on and so forth. Always, you see, uh, uh, this is uh, a case is a major uh, Italian chef that uh, recently passed away. But uh, all that we did was to put uh, beauty and healthy and, the, and green in the same in the same pocket because. Uh, it is very important to motivate people to do things that they like, not to try to constrain them to do things that do not like or do not understand. That's why we, uh, we trademark the concept of engineering awareness. This is a, a food diary, which is uh, helping you in uh, with a software uh, sensor to keep trace of what you eat, so you can have a, a tail interaction with our nutrition, so the tail nutrition uh, engine in a very hybrid way. Sometimes you go physical, most of the time you are connected with, uh, with your app, but always the liability is of the medical brand, you know, in this case, uh, the Serafael Hospital, which is providing the service. We did this for physical activity. I don't know, I don't go in detail. We did this uh, putting sensor in uh, other accessories so we can measure several other uh, dimensions of what, what your well-being, exposure to UV, uh, light, uh, posture, and so on and so forth. We did is uh, extended the concept of edutainment, not only uh, to the digital uh, interaction, but also to the embodiment uh, of physical uh, games like uh, anthropomorphic robot, as you see here. And we did it uh, for schools and for uh, healthy uh, kids, but also for, uh, for kids with diabetes uh, in the hospital. And once they go outside of the hospital, they are followed by the system. 
This is a look and feel of how we really deploy this approach of edutainment. You see, this is a gaming experience for the kids, but they are learning and they are getting aware and they are transmitting and they are biasing and changing their behavior because of this awareness coming from trustworthy sources. And they are also ambassador of this healthiness to other uh, uh, friends or family uh, circles. This is something that we did uh, in automotive. So we, we personalized the interaction with the command of the automotive to minimize the cognitive effort using a multimodal approach. And we designed a chair that you can see here, which uh, moves automatically and helps you in getting in and out of the car according to your needs and optimize the posture when you are in the car to optimize uh, your interaction, safe uh, interaction with the car, but also to minimize any risk of uh, um, problem at the backbone or cardiovascular problem because of unregular posture when you're seated in a car. And for example, we put also a robot in the trunk that is basically making the loading and unloading of the, of the, of the weight. So it, this is not on your, on your backbone, it's on, uh, on the car, uh, let's say, power. This is the car that we tested in San Rafaele streets and premises. We are working a lot on arts from different perspectives, art as a motivator uh, for convincing people to make the stairs and art as a way to uh, stimulate uh, from a cognitive and emotional perspective uh, uh, individuals in daily life at the workplace, but also in, uh, in, in hospital and, therapy and therapeutic settings. We work a lot with the real estate, as we're telling you, in the smart city dimension. And this is an example of a brand new smart city in which uh, uh, we, are, we, we make an agreement to design all the social and well-being aspect of the, uh, of the uh, entire ecosystem. So from the residential part to the public part, to the green part, to the retail and the workplace, of, uh, of the smart city, which uh, is going to be uh, constructed uh, soon uh, near, uh, near Milano in a very, uh, let's say, interesting settings. And obviously, we are very, very open to incubate and accelerate startups. This is a, a very popular program on uh, Italian uh, uh, um, Sky Channel, okay? It's called Be Heroes where we nurture and help uh, startups uh, in the field of uh, health tech. Uh, and, but this is an example to say that uh, all of our assets are a pipeline to be, uh, to be transferred uh, with uh, industrial contract to companies that want to scale up and bring into the market using our smart city as a living bed, as a flagship, uh, let's say, living uh, lab for their innovation, as well as uh, we are uh, uh, open and we include our, uh, our capacity in uh, external uh, um, business development plans so that companies that are willing to uh, deploy a broader scheme of their, of their innovation that they come to us in our ecosystem. And what is interesting is that all this ecosystem is uh, making innovation interacting together. So interoperability is not only a need at the technological level, it's also needed the organizational business and human experience level. That's why we bring the concept of internal interoperability, not only at the technical level of how data are exchanged in workloads, okay, but also in the physical place where real systems interact in a real environment with real people on an everyday life. So this is my very quick tour in what we have done and what we are doing and what we are willing to do more and more in the domain of, in, in such a complex ecosystem. And I just want to underline that there is no chance for having a sustainable innovation if you don't really make it a test in a real living environment, not only in a laboratory or in a conceptual environment. And if you don't put in interoperability, not only from the technical perspective, but also from the business model and, uh, and the operational perspective. Thank you. So thank you so much, Roberto, for your very impressive journey about the ecosystem. Um, I have one question for you, because we mentioned that sharing information among different administration is the key point. 
And uh, sometimes we have the hospitals, but close to the hospital where is the municipalities and maybe some other city providers. Alberto, what are the main barriers to uh, enable this kind of exchange of information? Briefly, we have a couple of minutes, but this is the real core of the ecosystem. What you can say on this? I can say that uh, according to also what uh, other speakers has just said, uh, we are all, all of this strategy and all our belief is that uh, the owner of the data is the individual. Full stop. So here the key point is to offer the individual a safe environment where to store this data. So what you have seen here is that most of the data that are relevant for behavioral uh, purposes, and we are remember that we are in a behavioral economy, are basically already a, available in the healthcare record. If I know how old you are, if you are and where you live, and so on and so forth, most of the behavioral data are available. If other data are generated, uh, self-generated by the individual, and the individual has a safe place to deposit it uh, in the environment, here we are. What is really owned by the city is, in a sense, uh, or, or by other players, is something that, uh, at the end of the day, I see in one way or another being owned anyway from the citizen. I make you an example: the supermarket. The supermarket has huge amount of my data, but with the with the norm with the regulation that we have now, if I want the supermarket to provide me a copy, possibly a digital copy of my data, maybe I have problem in the first, uh, in the first uh, let's say, uh, uh, attempt. But at the end of the day, legislation will recognize that I am entitled to edit. And the same is for with many other players that uh, uh, allegedly own our data, but basically our data are our data that are also owned, owned not owned by third players. So I believe that uh, with the enforcement of the privacy regulation in Europe, we are absolutely very well uh, positioned to have the capacity to collect those data and have a personal availability of this and decide on the individual level according to value that we can uh, generate out of this, which is not necessarily a, 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 a financial value, it's also a social value or whatever, something there is more chance for, for us as a community to take uh, our data and have the capacity of uh, feed the system rather than to negotiate with the uh, hundreds of very rigid uh, organization that yeah. uh, may be uh, willing to uh, collaborate or not. So I am, let's say, a fan of uh, individual taking control of their own data and individual aggregating uh, and creating value out of their data, uh, summing up uh, the, uh, these uh, this obviously with all the control of ownership of this data. I hope okay, to have uh, thank you. answered thank to you your uh, question, which is a very tricky one. Yeah, we, we, we need time to, to uh, explore this subject and probably we will ask the Fiverr Foundation to set up another five day. For now, thank you so much for very impressive thank contribution. You. And now we move to another um, speech uh, uh, for, from the Fiverr Foundation. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to Juan Cogliero. Um, his speech is, is about uh, Fiverr for Health and Vision and uh, Roadmap. Well, uh, Juanco is very well known within the Fiverr community. He's currently the CTO of the Fiverr Foundation, and also chairman of the Technical Steering Committee, and uh, is uh, uh, following and supporting the, the Fiverr community. So, Juanco, for 10 minutes plus Q&A, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lanfranco. Okay, um, Fiverr is becoming, and thank you for the introduction. Um, so Fiverr is becoming the open source platform of choice for the development of smart solutions in multiple sectors. And we believe it can certainly apply as well to the uh, health sector. Actually, I invite the audience to not miss some of the testimonies we will hear today about quite interesting smart solutions powered by Fiverr which have uh, proven to solve effectively quite uh, demanding challenges like that of COVID-19. Um, what is the basic technical approach when architecting systems powered by Fiverr? 
and therefore also smart solutions in the health sector powered by fiber. Well, smart solutions powered by fiber gravitate around the digital twin representation of the real world, which is obtained by means of capturing data from many different sources, and this way being able to continuously keep in update and processing that digital twin data to automate processes and bring support to the kind of smart decisions that are required. What do we mean by digital twin? Uh, well, they are digital entities classified into types, which are characterized by well-defined attributes, which are either properties describing the status of the real object being represented, and also relationship with other objects. We have in the, uh, if we are talking about a solution for a hospital, for instance, we, we will have uh, entities like the hospital itself with um, the surgery rooms, the patients, the um, uh, ambulances, each of them with the properties that describe them and um, are um, uh, capable to create this digital twin representation. Of course, everyone is talking about digital twins today, today uh, quite friendly buzzword, but the real fact is that there are no standards for digital twins that developers can rely on to be able to develop interoperable and replicable or portable solutions two basic elements need to be standardized, and that is what Fiverr is bringing in the first place. An API to get access to the digital twin data, I mean those properties and relationships I was talking about before, and also common data models describing what concrete properties the different types of entities support, what are the properties of a surgery room or um, um, uh, a hospital, a patient, uh, like for instance, it's a patient record, uh, of course, the ID, uh, the current treatment, and all this kind of information. Based on this digital twin approach, Fireway is capable to support, in the first place, uh, the development of solutions uh, or solving particular challenges, for instance, an emergency system, uh, and this digital twin representation helps to integrate data uh, coming from the sensors, but also from third systems that particular emergency, emergency system, for instance, may need to connect. Um, but the digital twin paradigm, on the other hand, is also cornerstone to break the information silos within complex organizations, like in hospital, where the different systems that need to interoperate share this common digital twin representation describing what's going on in the hospital and uh, those systems being able to publish and at the same time consume information in this uh, common data space. Last but not least, uh, enabling um, ultimately to support in how these complex systems like a hospital may interact with other systems like the city, like logistic uh, systems, like the smart grid, and then be able to create a quite way more sophisticated data value chains. We can think about a, a city that opens the street lights so that ambulances can run faster. You need to uh, integrate those systems and fireware and the creation of a common standard, a standard that works across domain is the kind of thing that will enable this to happen. Uh, I mentioned before an API, common data models. What are the standards that Fiverr is bringing in terms of the API? NGSI is the API we have uh, brought, uh, curated over time with the experience of developers. We created a first version of the API called NGSI version two, which has now been standardized by the HCO organization and brings a standard which is very important, could be a reference for public tenders in the health sectors and so on. Data models is the second key standard that Fiverr is bringing. And here we have to talk about an initiative we launched uh, towards definition of the smart data models that can work with the NGSI API and where we are increasingly coming with new and new uh, models every day, the community is contributing with models in different sectors because also one crucial aspect will be this 
cross-domain uh, ability to uh, connect uh, different systems. Endorsement at global level of these uh, kind of standards, I think, is the basis to really trust this is uh, fireware the, um, the kind of uh, technology to adopt on 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 on, on the one hand uh, etsy as i mentioned before uh, which adopted the api is a, a public uh, standard and uh, also very important the connecting euro facility program which has also um, quite relevant connections to the health sector where the context vocal technology, which is a core component within a, any kind of a power by power architecture implementing the NGSI API, has been adopted as one of the CEF uh, building blocks and therefore a rec official recommendation by the European Commission whenever we are thinking about how to develop and create digital service infrastructures that will support the kind of smart ser services that in the health sector we need. PM Phone, an organization we are collaborating with, uh, that uh, and, and more organizations will be joining soon in creating this set of uh, smart data models that uh, will uh, pave the way for interoperability and replicability of solutions. With all these elements and based on this digital twin approach, is how we propose that uh, systems can be architected. Of course, I cannot go and I'll elaborate on, in all detail about how uh, the different elements of this architecture, but here we have um, a kind of a sketch of how a smart hospital power by power may look like. And you see here how kind of uh, in the middle, in the core is this context broker technology, keeping support, managing the digital twin data representation of what's going on in the hospital and uh, how the, different systems, not only the smart hospital uh, level management system, but also all the systems that we may think about, like uh, connected to the hospital, like the uh, emergency service, the uh, system dealing with the patient records, the surgeries, plannings, the even waste management, because you, of course, have to deal with the logistic about how to manage the waste within a hospital. All of these systems can be interconnected, uh, uh, relying on this digital twin um, data uh, representation. Last slide to uh, give uh, some key messages about what comes next, because Fireware is, of course, evolving, is a living product and uh, uh, um, moving forward uh, uh, based on the contributions by the uh, very vibrant community around the technology. And I wanted to just mention five points, which I think uh, might be relevant for the uh, health sector. Um, of course, this idea of the down twin standardization, how to uh, really make it a de facto standard, supporting interoperability within systems is something we keep working and um, extending features as we receive feedback from uh, actual usage in the different domains. Um, uh, the definition of data models is a second very important thing, uh, is the basics for uh, enabling this interoperability we are talking about and cornerstone to achieve these um, interesting cross-domain uh, 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 data value chains and, and processes that, uh, that uh, could be really improved by means of connecting not just the health systems but uh, um, other kind of systems in the cities, in the logistic operators and uh, smart ports and, 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 and everything. Data sovereignty is an area where we also are working a lot. Of course, fiber comes with all the um, existing um, state-of-the-art standards on what refers to access control because privacy and access control on data, of course, and mostly in health, is a cornerstone aspect, but we are moving forward and um, and, and, and developing uh, new ideas in uh, support of quite advanced concepts like data usage control. What can be done with my data once it has been obtained? Also, federated identity management, how to 
you know, deal with uh, the aspects about identity of the patients across the different systems. Fourth element, and, and quite interesting, I think, very promising looking forward, integration with blockchain distributed ledger technologies, because that will help to um, ensure transparency in some of the processes within uh, health that are so important to, to, to run forensics when it's needed, but also certify quality of the, um, of the processes. Last but not least, um, Fiware and this is standardization regarding how to integrate the data, how to expose the data and consume the data is uh, uh, going to pave the way for what we referred as plug and play artificial intelligence machine learning services that um, uh, can be plugged into uh, existing systems to enrich their functionality and be able to uh, bring um, um, all the expertise coming from um, AI, uh, AI experts, machine learning experts into the health domain. Conclusions, Fiber brings response to existing challenges regarding interoperability and replicability of solutions in the health sector, an approach that works cross the main, paving the way for the connection of health systems with other systems like the cities, like the logistic operators, reaching this way higher levels of productivity and an approach that is future-proof uh, because we have a, a rather a powerful comprehensive roadmap in place and don't forget fireware is open for all forever thank you thank you so much Kwanko, for your impressive presentation and you keep time perfectly but uh, i want to spend a couple just a couple of minutes for two brief uh, answers to two questions from Ali, which are very interesting and in place in this uh, Fiverr Health Day. So the first question is related, what about health interoperability standards integration, such as HL7 into Fiverr? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I didn't mention, but I think, uh, thank you for this question, because uh, I hope it uh, helps to elaborate um, about that. When we talk about the smart data models, and, and, and this is the basis for describing what we are interchanging about, right? And the idea is not to define those data models from the scratch, but actually leverage on existing standards. And um, standards that, like the one you mentioned are, are bringing um, the kind of uh, models that uh, we simply need to map into the kind of uh, JSON or JSON on these structures that then are compatible and can be used in combination with the NGSI API. This way creating a kind of a common lingua because uh, don't forget what is also important is that the kind of uh, a standard for exchange of data we adopt, um, uh, we will reach a lot of benefit if it becomes the same that is adopted for smart cities, for uh, smart logistics and other sectors because this way we will be able to you know really uh, get the most out of the combination of data but the um, um, coming again uh, to your question our idea is always rely on the system standard don't reinvent the wheel but find out how it could be uh, those standards can be integrated into this digital twin approach uh, for um, interoperability and integration of systems. Okay, and the last, very last question, Quanco, uh, can be e health sector, the fifth sector besides agri food, smart cities, smart industry, smart energy in the final strategy? Again from Ali. <laughs> That's a question that perhaps is, is, is not only for me, but probably for the board of directors of the, of the Fiber Foundation, which uh, drives and beat the strategy. But what I can say is that I see a lot of, uh, you know, promising um, uh, prospects regarding adoption of, of, of Fiber in the health sector. I, I always think something like a hospital is like a, like a city in itself. Uh, so, how, why, why not the kind of the same approaches that have uh, um, um, proved to be rather successful in cities cannot be applied here and 
even further exploit the synergies that uh, those different sectors may have. So really, I think um, health is 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 a very good candidate for this fifth um, sector. Okay, thank you, thank you, Quanco. We are just a few minutes away from our agenda, and now let's jump on the overseas. We jump directly in Portland, Oregon, with the city of Portland, where Hector Dominguez will talk about uh, using open data in open standards to promote public trust in the city of Portland. And um, Hector, uh, the floor is your Hector is an open data coordinator in the city of Portland, Oregon, and uh, is also part of the city PDX team and uh, led privacy and uh, information initiatives in the city. So Hector, the floor is your, uh, you have 15 minutes plus five minutes for the question. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, I really appreciate all the previous talks and presenters. Uh, I'm learning a lot. And I hope everyone uh, participating here, both as a presenter and audience, are safe. I want to appreciate also all the people involved in, in public health in general, because uh, you guys are saving lives. And, uh, and we are here to help. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share some of the um, on the ground experience from the perspective of a, an American city, uh, medium size. Portland, Oregon is in the uh, west coast of the United States. Uh, we are a medium sized city, 600,000 people. Just the city, the whole metropolitan area is probably about 2 million people. So the, the, our city is uh, does not have the all the budget that bigger cities in the U.S. have, like let's say New York City, San Francisco, or Seattle. Uh, so, uh, but also we have some uh, enough to to do and try things. And, and obviously, the population that we serve is is consider considerable enough that we need to do a good job in general. But and we are also we are thinking all the time about how what we do can actually be implemented in, a, in small towns. Oregon has a, like a, hundreds of those that don't have the resources that the city like Portland has. So for us, we are in the middle, that middle layer, and, and we, we want to try things. We want to be in, innovative in many ways, but thinking about learning from those who have more resources and thinking about those who are following uh, after us. So after, the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis was declared in Portland, which happened in March uh, this year. Mm -hmm. So our Smart Cities team started like thinking about how we are going to react to all that, how we are going to prepare to all that. We already had some plans on moving towards from business as usual, a lot of paper, still a lot of paper-based kind of forms and, and, uh, and a culture that really came from some times from 20 years ago, even more, um, to more digital services. So that's, that was our plan. However, COVID-19 uh, really uh, accelerated everything for us and changed everybody's life. Uh, so we came out with this idea of having done, um, some digital actions, very, very targeted. Uh, you can see, like, starting to uh, reinforce the, our open data program and data sharing with other uh, within the city and also with other uh, agencies uh, beyond the city. Uh, working around privacy as a way to gain, start gaining trust, public trust, and, and retain public trust. That's one of the main parameters there. The city, and just as a reference for everyone here, the, our city does not provide uh, public health services other than uh, first responders like fire and police uh, and emergency management. So we actually collaborate with our uh, public health agencies that are actually managed by the state and, uh, and we share information with them and we uh, get information from them. So that, that's really important. And then when we serve our different people, privacy has been the key for uh, starting gaining some of the public trust. You know, when we have a number of issues around uh, law enforcement and how the, uh, in general, uh, government uh, serves different sectors in the population, particularly 
thinking about who, those who have been uh, marginalized, uh, people of color, uh, black communities, for instance, that they have been historically left behind. So we are trying to change that approach and then put them uh, first uh, and then try to, to provide all these different services to them. Uh, and then because of that, the digital inclusion actions have been really important. We got some funding money uh, from the CARES Act, uh, federal money to start providing a, right now, I think it's like a, a 1500 uh, different devices to people who have uh, some need, and we are doing uh, that through uh, organizations, local organizations. And then reimagining what surveillance actually looks like in this new age, you know? So at this point, so back then we, we used the term trusted surveillance. Right now we are actually trying to reimagine if surveillance is the right term when we relate to uh, the people who live here regardless of who they are. Because of that, so the city uh, put together all these different uh, privacy principles uh, that actually came from last year, from 2019. Uh, and you can see, this is an effort to try to uh, look into the current and modern technology. So we use uh, existing principles from other cities and we added a couple of those. I'm going to focus on them, uh, which is uh, automated decision systems and data utility and automated decision system have, have to do with all uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, and how uh, we can, we need to create actually layers of transparency and accountability uh, audits around that. And data utility has to do with data minimization. So European uh, countries and, and cities are now aware of all that because of uh, GDPR, the general data protection regulation. But data utility also means that everything that we collect has to bring some value, both for those uh, people who uh, we collect that data and for the city. And so with all that, so now we, we started working on how we are going to procure services for the city. Uh, what kind of uh, compliance and regulations we need to follow, uh, what kind of privacy rights in general, you know, uh, kind of putting together all the, the big puzzle that as a government we need to follow. Uh, that includes uh, all the public records laws, transparency, uh, retention times, for instance, uh, cybersecurity, of course, where uh, the cities are in constant threat of being hacked and having all these different malware in different points. So it gets quite complicated, even for, for a small cities and municipalities, right? And we all that, we, we just need to be aware of that. Uh, in order to provide trusted services, we need to be compliant with all these different layers that we are building in. Uh, and at the same time, so cities and governments are, um, have the reputation of being slow. Of course, bureaucracy is kind of a synonym of uh, being slow. We want to challenge that. We are still slow, however, but uh, we want to challenge that. We want to actually, our assumption is that through digital services, we can be more agile and we can actually integrate different services. Uh, and we cannot do that without all these open standards with this uh, transparency layers across federalizing all these different uh, services and due diligence that includes uh, the privacy assessment, cybersecurity assessments, uh, for instance, is also part of that transparency and openness that we need to offer. Then, so right now we are starting with um, putting together some privacy impact assessments. So uh, as a service, as, a, as an initial checkpoint for, for all that, uh, the privacy impact assessment is just a method in which we evaluate and, and, and look into how a particular service is, being, is collecting, using, sharing data and accessing data for, for whatever purpose we want. Uh -huh. And, and in general, so the city has this uh, workflow in which we are looking into the technology itself first, 
uh, we do a, like a initial impact assessment where the technology that we are looking at, we make sure that they follow the standards that the city needs to follow. Uh, we make sure that also liability and accountability is well set. Uh, and that the service that we are uh, contracting with is actually fulfilling the needs that we we, we have. Uh -huh. If and after that step, so we look into how the city is going to look uh, and, and use uh, data in general. So it, that's the privacy impact assessment, how the agency, in particular the agency is going to use the information, uh, what kind of value that brings to the city and so on. And if for any reason, the, the technology that we are evaluating is, uh, is considered surveillance, then we jumped into a more even more comprehensive assessment that involves a lot of more public involvement and, and, and the due diligence on that is, is a lot deeper with a, with a lot more engaged, public engagement in there. And then we need to publish a report. So, more and more we see like for instance uh, social media monitoring and mass uh, surveillance in X and or different ways will require this sort of assessment and, and so we are rethinking how we can do it in a way that is not as expensive for cities. So this is a sample of uh, our initial kind of version for the pilot that we are looking at and, and you can see we, we look into the policy, uh, the privacy policy for, for the service. Uh, so if, for instance, we recently did a, a privacy impact assessment for uh, a service for uh, participatory democracy, and that was provided by uh, an European company. And we, from that assessment, actually, we learned that the the agreement between Europe and the U.S. actually was turned down by the judge court, the European court, and right now, all if an European, if data from the US actually moves to Europe, it's actually kind of in, in, in not well defined how is that protected. So that's, those sort of issues can be identified here. And uh, if, you, if you are uh, a company that is not based in the US, so there is a special also, we're looking into how the information is being moved. Are, are you providing this service in a server here in the US? Uh, who has access to that information? Whether if your service has any uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning claims, so how is that, are you identifying all the biases inside? Uh, so we are learning in this process. However, the, at the end of that, we want to provide fair services to everyone. Uh, with that so assessment, we get to uh, a general risk uh, measure, which basically that's the final product that we offer with the, with the privacy. This risk at this point, we are actually trying to merge it with existing other risks, including cybersecurity. And with that, we the idea is to uh, develop strategies for mitigating all these different risks. Uh, the city has a Portland Urban Data Lake uh, as a way in which we can actually uh, channel all the different data flows, uh, uh, the data ingestion, data cleaning, sharing, cyber security, uh, do the exploration and interpretation. This has been actually uh, one of the biggest challenges because of the economics of maintaining uh, a system like this. You know, they are the return of investment of this it hasn't been that clear. We are still learning on, on what we can do with the resources that we have available uh, because so those are very dynamic resources uh, and budgets in within the city are not that dynamic. So we are trying to figure out how we can actually either work with our budgets uh, or constrain the resources so we don't go over budget and we uh, fulfill all, all these different uh, challenges that we have. Uh, so this is an ongoing effort and, uh, and we are starting with in a startup mode, right? basically. We start small, we, we iterate, if we fail, we fail and we move on. And then with that approach, we're actually getting some, some um, results. So open standards, definitely something that we are looking into. 
and it's based on all the what we're doing in open standards and and we w try to avoid uh being outside the um being locked down to a specific cloud platform for instance uh and then finally so with COVID 19 we are in in a regional effort for data and information so that includes uh not only the city of portland but other cities around plus uh some rural areas as well and we are looking into integrating not only like uh public health information but also uh transportation economy environmental impacts uh all the different needs from the community and uh, the equity perspectives of all that so if you can see so we have also some vulnerability analysis across different neighborhoods in portland so we can focus on the specific needs for a specific neighborhoods uh and that's just uh really starting uh, at this point uh, and we are hoping that by the beginning of 2021, we can actually have more production on this regard. And with that, I'm finished. So thank you so much, Hector, for your interesting presentation. You are an expert in open data. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, what's your view about uh, um, smart data model and the way you can uh, implement data model, having in mind a, a, wide, a wide vision of the city, engaging all the, the stakeholders in the city you have mentioned before? Yes. Um, yeah, I, know, I know it's a tricky question in one minute, but uh, so the vision of a smart data models, how can you use it? Uh, what is the benefit using uh, uh, smart data models in managing the, the also crisis, health crisis in the city? you know the first of all i think we we need to change our relationship with data here in the us one of the challenges uh, that is big difference to europe is that we don't have we don't have a, a strong privacy framework legal privacy framework with the exceptions of california uh no other state has that so and 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 that's a big challenge there we we as a city we're trying to do our best so we, we have our the privacy principles, but at this point we don't have more. We are working on, on trying to put some uh, local legal framework for 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 both. I mean, not only for the people to understand what are the rights, but also for uh, service providers, companies, for instance, to understand what is what we are asking for, you know, and then we are all win to win. And 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 it's been kind of a learning process for everyone, including uh, the city, including companies, including the city, the uh, the people here in Portland. Okay, thank you so much, Hector. Thank you so much All for right. your presentation. I now have the pleasure of announcing our next speaker, which is uh, Lanfranco Morasso, um, a digital strategist at Engineering. And now earlier this year, Engineering actively joined the battle against COVID-19 with its ready-to-use fiber-based surveillance platform. And now if you've ever wondered if data can save lives, uh, the answer is yes, yes it can. And uh, Lanfranco will now tell and show us exactly how that works with the DE for bias use case. So Lanfranco, the stage is yours. Yes, I'm more comfortable in this uh, in this rule of uh, um, uh, speaker, even if uh, not moderator. But I, I keep time on my on my phone. By the way, can data save lives? Uh, I want to share with you uh, a journey again uh, about what we did in the last uh, recent years uh, together with Fineware, what we did uh, against COVID in the in last six months. So talking about city and health, uh, what we can say in the world, something went wrong. Went wrong in terms of uh, pollution, in terms of environment, in terms of uh, traffic jam, and also in, ter in terms of uh, pandemic. And uh, the main problem has been in, uh, in, in data. So we started a few years ago working on a, a platform uh, which is uh, powered by fiber completely 100 uh, percent and uh, which is called digital enabler uh, something able to enable digitally a uh, complex system like a city but uh, also industries also telco utilities and now health what is basically the job of the digital enabler first of all to support you in order to discover and gather data um, we cannot start from scratch 
because uh, we have a number of different information on the table, information systems and IoTs and uh, virtual and physical infrastructure, and uh, we have to use it. And the digital enabler is able to support you in order to discover the data you need. Once you have data, the, the challenge is how can we harmonize data? Because the combination of data is the real value in order to provide uh, added value services to, to our um, adopters and users. And the last part, once you have harmonized data, you can apply um, algorithm or artificial intelligence, or maybe we can, we can say as you want, but we can create value around data as Uber did, as uh, Netflix did, or uh, Alibaba or all the others. Also in our cities and in this terrible period of COVID, also with uh, against COVID in health, we can do the same, trying to get the best that by the combination of data. Um, just to give an overview about what we did in the, in the last three years, we had a number of projects all around the world, including smart parking, air quality management, bike sharing, power supply, street lighting. So a lot of things which are really tangible. You can touch it, you can control. But suddenly, early this year, end of February, something happens in, in Italy. And uh, we experienced the first COVID case uh, around uh, February 21st. And um, the region of Veneto, which is the region worldwide famous because Venice uh, is about 5 million people, um, contacted us and he said, that we have a number of different information which are available. And uh, we are all under control of the, of the government. But we need to combine all those information in order to manage the future COVID crisis. And this was exactly what we did. And uh, I'm very uh, in love with this picture because uh, we started discussing with, uh, with the regional government in the end of February, you can see 27th of February, and this is a sketch on my iPad. And very few days later, March 4th, we released the first application for more than 5,000 doctors using the system in order to plan the activities uh, with the very patients. You can imagine, I'm talking about six months ago, but it seems to talk about six centuries ago. Uh, we, 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 we passed a lot of experience in the last six months. And on the right hand side, you can see early March, we started working for the task force of the government in order to collect completely different information for the task force. And a uh, few days later, we released this platform. But how can we manage this time? Basically, there is a point. We did not reinvent the wheel and we don't reinvent any information. It's not possible in that time. All the information were closed in some boxes and some silos within the responsibility of the government. But the real value to, to put in place the strategy of the regional government was to combine the information altogether in order to manage the crisis. So starting from the uh, microbiology labs, we combined information with the electronic health record, we combined information from the hospitals, we combined information with the people working in the hospital and with some other sources. Now, after seven months, at the beginning of the second wave, also in Italy, uh, we are developed, I can say, a real biosurveillance system, which is 100% based on fiber. But the most important part is that fiber is here on the red tape, not for uh, like in the cinema or in the theater, Hollywood, but the red tape is, is something which is important because we just bring data according to data model according to standards, open standards, and we use CSV files or Oracle View or web service or um, micro proxy, a number of different technologies depending on the information system providing the information. But uh, we don't care about the source. The important part is to get the right information in order to combine information, to give to the doctor, to the specialist, right information in the right time. And the right time is one of the keywords of fiber. 
the right information in the right time. So what, what we did basically was to collect information. And as you can see here in the picture, where is the world famous curve uh, with the motto uh, flatten the curve. And uh, you can see the blue one is the theoretical curve and the, the red one is the, the curve made by the, the data observed on the field. Just to give an idea, we started collecting data from uh, two micro labs uh, twice a day. Then we move every six hours, three hours. Now we collect from more than 30 labs the data hourly. It means that we are working in real time or in the right time for these kind of things. And why uh, this is important? Because thanks to this data, uh, we, can, uh, we can understand and predict how will be the peak and how many people will be affected and how many beds in intensive care department we need to take care. And this was exactly what we did during the peak of the crisis in, uh, in last March and April in Italy. Uh, I'll give an example. Uh, out of 5 million persons in the region of Veneto, we manage with our model here. Our model, uh, I mean, we, as an IT specialist, we just provide data. But the medical doctor and the virologist and the epidemiologist are the real core and, the, and knowledge of this system. They realize the number of beds needed in order to assure the beds for everyone. And uh, the, the model, uh, defined that uh, at the peak of the crisis, uh, we needed uh, nearly 500, uh, I mean uh, 480, and we got uh, 465. So the model was very useful in order to predict the how to plan the action on the field in the city in order to, to I would say, save lives. So, um, these are a few uh, screenshots, but I'll show you the real system. After a few months, looking at the data, we realized that something happened in, in terms of uh, uh, the spreading of the virus and the behavior of the virus. Uh, so one dot on the map, meaning one person is infected, become quickly two dots, means a family, or three dots, or 10 dots, or 20 dots. When we realize 20 dots, we say, as the IT expert, we did a mistake, we are in fault, something wrong happening in information system, not. We discover in this way, the hospice for elderly people. And uh, it, this was super important because we can uh, properly act quickly on the field in order to support the people living in there. And uh, this is a way where just a dot or two dots or 10 dots on the map can give you real-time information. And during the last month, we experienced that uh, the, the most important part now, uh, after the lockdown in the phase two and three, is to manage the outbreaks. Managing the outbreaks means try to understand where the outbreaks are. So we develop uh, an algorithm uh, with an index, which is called MGL index, which is an index where with the only one number, we need to give to the doctor or to the people in the, in the task force every morning or every hour looking at the new data coming into the system if a new outbreak appears somewhere. And uh, we realized this, uh, this uh, algorithm working on the positive people, uh, what happened around the uh, positive and uh, so far and so on. And is this the artificial intelligence? I don't know, but it's something uh, which is working and it's, uh, intelligent in a way because uh, it is supporting the people in uh, in uh, in the field let me spend my last uh, four minutes showing a few sample of the system so basically we started working uh, from the uh, the test molecular test and we have all the information and we move managing the the person having a test these data are fake of course and uh, combining the information in one click, the task force can have an overview about how many people is infected, how many people is, uh, is in the hospital, how many people uh, is in, in the intensive care department, and uh, the rest uh, should be at home. 
and um, of course divided by cities and province and council and all the other things. And this is quite important because in this way, all the majors can take some decision depending on the spreading of the virus. I spent la my last two uh, minutes showing you how com in the combination of data, these are fake data of course, we can find a person on the map and uh, we can uh, find the infected or uh, held person and uh, we know Mario, a very common name in Italy, is positive and uh, unfortunately he is in, in the hospital and he has been in the hospital in the recent years but the most important part is Mario is living with Federica and Federica is not yet infected but uh, we are living together and Federica has some uh, health problem so Federica need to be a priority, need to have a priority to run a test in order to control her state of, of uh, health uh, with, uh, with COVID. Uh, let me close the presentation with the real system. I don't dive into the real data, of course. Uh, this is updated a few hours ago. And uh, we just overcome yesterday 2 million tests on a population of 5 million tests. This is quite important in the region of Veneto. But now we are managing also the region of Lombardia. So covering 15 million person, 15 million means a country like the Netherlands, the 10th country in Europe. And uh, with, the, with the clusters, uh, we are able to define the cluster at home or the clusters in the, in the, in the area, in the region. And um, I want to show you as the last part, the, the trends. Of, uh, um, of the cases. As you can see, this is the uh, real situation in, uh, in, uh, since the beginning of the story, early end of February. And the lockdown, uh, we closed the country in Italy in around uh, March the 10th. And we reached the peak uh, early April. Uh, we start opening something in May. We reopen some other activities in June. But now, if you look at the last month, if you look at the last week, the trends is going up. So we must be careful and uh, we all must be careful. So um, thank you for your attention. I keep my time and save one minute. So I try to recover in my fault in the being long in the pre previous presentation. And uh, I leave you the floor for some question from you all. Yes, thank you, Lanfranco. Um, you nicely presented the use case of the virus surveillance system, and um, which is in Veneto, which has been heavily impacted. Is the solution currently also in use in, in other regions, or, or will it be in the future? And can you tell us a little bit more about how the solution helps the reality on the ground in that sense? Uh, thank you for the question. We are uh, actually working also in the region Lombardia, which is the region of Milan, as I mentioned before, with 15 million people covered. And uh, thanks to Fiverr, we had the opportunity to present the, this uh, Fiverr solution, uh, powered by Fiverr solution to all the communities. And we had a number of meetings uh, within the community in Africa, in South America, in North America, in Asia. But in most of the cases, one of the big issues is to the access to data and the privacy issues. But at least in Europe, uh, the GDPR has been uh, changed due to the emergency in the pandemic and the data, at least for the uh, health authority, can be managed easily. Uh, but uh, it's not easy to convince politicians and all the others because uh, we are used to publish any kind of uh, uh, personal information on our social network, but uh, we are very conservative to publish the, the information uh, related to health. But uh, we are working with a number of uh, potential adopters, uh, but uh, our hope if uh, the virus will be going down uh, as soon as uh, we can hope. So uh, let me change my jacket and uh, come back to be moderator to introduce the last speaker of the of the of the day. Uh, it's four o'clock. We are a few minutes in advance on the on the agenda. And let me introduce to us Peter. Hans Peter um, will present uh, um, a very interesting solution for home, home care, uh, strengthen families, enable living at home and avoid uh, escalation. So Hans Peter is a general manager, director managing at engineering in Germany, 
and easy is working in uh, different areas like smart cities uh, digital health and telematics and uh, we are eager to see your solution hans peter the floor is yours thank you yes thanks very much lang franco yeah as mentioned my name is hans peter i'm the managing director of uh, engineering germany and I would like to introduce a solution we developed uh, based on the principle of open source and uh, fiber. It's a solution uh, which uh, help uh, people to uh, nurse their relatives and uh, partners. And um, uh, it's an um, aligned approach together with some uh, public insurance uh, in uh, Germany. Um, uh, my uh, business line, Digital Solutions, has uh, two major pillars. One is uh, to support uh, um, the team from Lanco and Franco building smart uh, city um, um, solutions and uh, roll it out uh, also in, in Germany. The other pillar is um, a healthcare solution in the German uh, market. We have a strong focus on uh, public health insurance uh, companies. Uh, we help them uh, to find a revenue leakage, um, to identify new members or customer, or um, to prevent uh, the misuse of uh, public health cards. Uh, that's our main, uh, main focus. During our uh, work, uh, we find out that there is um, um, uh, a group of people who are not uh, treated quite well, who are not pre uh, treated in a way um, that they need. And that they are the people who take care of their relatives and uh, take care um, of uh, the, old, the elderly and um, uh, nursing uh, part of, of the family business. In Germany, uh, to recap it, about uh, 1.9 people need this kind of help and about 4.5 million uh, people in Germany are doing this job. And uh, most, uh, more than uh, two thirds of these cases are doing that alone without any external help. So no outpatient nursing services involved. And uh, for this uh, um, people, uh, we need some uh, solution which helps them uh, to survive in their, this uh, very emotional uh, phase of, of their life because uh, they have to take care of their parents and they have to be um, uh, active contributor at work and also they must take care of their families. So it's a real uh, challenge uh, for them and uh, we uh, try to find a solution together with uh, our public health um, uh, partners um, to make them uh, more confident and uh, to make them um, uh, to take care of their relatives in a good way. So uh, we defined um, a mobile app, which has uh, two or uh, three parts. One of course um, is, um, one of course is uh, a nursing guide where um, all the relevant um, um, details and uh, checklist and uh, education streams are present uh, to do the, um, the nursing. Um, because not only German people become uh, older and sick, also people from uh, foreign countries. Uh, we uh, built uh, this uh, solution uh, for, for different uh, language uh, that you also can do the uh, intercultural nursing. For example, if you come from Turkey or from Russia, then and the nursing process is a little bit different. Um, from the West European uh, nursing um, uh, phase. We take care of that. Then of course, uh, we have uh, integr uh, integrated um, uh, exchange platform. In this uh, exchange platform, you, you as um, um, a daughter, a son, can get in contact uh, with, uh, with other uh, people who do the, the nursing process also. You can, get in, uh, you can get in touch with uh, some professional services like uh, external nursing uh, companies uh, for hospitals and uh, general practices. Uh, so you are able um, to have in a critical situation, for example, during the night and very fast escalation process. And um, because um, nursing has also something to do to be prepared, there is an, a purchasing avatar available, 
where you can uh, get in contact with your doctor um, or with your chemistry to get the right medical uh, treatments and the right uh, support of all the things you need to do a good uh, nursing process. We um, built this um, um, uh, the system, and you see a screenshot um, uh, on the on the right side, uh, where you have a daily um, a routine, and uh, you can uh, see what you must uh, what you have to do, and uh, which things are needed to do it in a proper way. Uh, also, uh, there is a, a patient file uh, which you can share uh, with uh, in your family or with your doctor. Um, we discussed uh, um, the topic regarding data privacy uh, some minutes ago. Also here we have a uh, built-in -in system where uh, the, um, the treated um, patient um, is uh, of course the owner of the data other people are using um, for a process. And uh, we connected this to a multimedia um, uh, platform where you can see some tutorials, uh, where you can ask um, some question, or where you can use um, a wiki to see uh, what um, uh, what are the, the right uh, things to do. Um, because um, it's very important um, to connect it uh, to connect this um, uh, treatments and this process um, with uh, other things, uh, we are using uh, Fiverr. Fiverr for us is very important. Um, to have an interoperable connecting system in place. For example, uh, we are able uh, to get access to uh, open data, to smart home data, to uh, public service data, for example, for social treatments, and uh, of course, for the social uh, welfare uh, system. This is um, uh, the main reason why we are focusing on, on Fiverr, and uh, we um, uh, customized the system in a fast, feasible way uh, to start in a very fast approach. Okay, um, the basis system we developed um, included included a um, daily routine, uh, of course, the family link uh, in a secure uh, way, a video conference system where you can connect it also to your GP or to your uh, treatment center. You can export all the needed things into PDF. And uh, of course, uh, you can get access um, of uh, all the iPhone uh, um, capabilities to record texts and videos to share with uh, your doctor. Um, in our way, uh, we think uh, it's always a question of money, how the system can be financed. So uh, we decided um, to define a basis system and uh, we will develop this uh, BAS system in the next steps um, based on uh, open source uh, services and uh, would like to establish a community uh, with uh, business partners, with the civil society, and of course partners from the healthcare system to develop uh, this mobile app uh, in an um, open source approach, which helps, for example, also big companies um, to give a better support to the workers if the workers are uh, involved in any kind of uh, family uh, nursing processes. So um, to recap this, um, uh, we defined a very um, open uh, platform system based on uh, Fiverr. Fiverr was a very impressive uh, tool to uh, save time and uh, to save uh, development um, uh, efforts. So uh, we were really able to run it out and to connect uh, other partners based on the fiber architecture. And uh, here you see uh, some of our screenshots um, for the time being. Uh, I cannot show an, a live demo, but uh, here you have your, your uh, treatment screens. You can use it uh, in a community approach. For example, if elderly people live together in, in one uh, household, then uh, you are able um, to, to treat every um, a patient in their own way, uh, which also respects uh, all the, the data privacy stuff. And uh, we think that it's a good approach. And we cross our finger that uh, our German public health uh, insurance companies will um, uh, still uh, support this and we can roll out it during the next uh, one or two years uh, as a German basis services. Yeah, that's for the time. Um, our approach, um, how we want to define um, a better nursing process for um, home treatments. 
So thank you so much, Hans Peter, also to to keep the time. And uh, I, I have a one question for you. You mentioned the benefits using uh, um, fireware to develop software, but uh, I would ask you. Uh, if you could uh, briefly explain uh, what can be the benefit of uh, using fireware in order to exploit the results. So uh, how can we push your, your solution uh, having fireware in, in the background? Well, first of all, it's, it's a very um, um, discrete uh, thing uh, to do the nursing process. Uh, for fiverr uh, we needed um, to get uh, access for example the the, the data models uh, we talked uh, an hour ago for hl7 um, uh, data models uh, we have uh, different other patient records in, in germany in place and uh, fiverr help us to connect the things and uh, to have an end-to-end -end process uh, in place Okay, so um, I think um, we are in the in the end of uh, the meeting. Uh, we we are perfectly on time uh, with the agenda proposed. Thank you to all the speakers uh, to um, for your very excellent presentation. Let me leave you the floor to Christina Brandstetter, the CMO the Fiber Foundation, for the closing remarks. Thank you, Christina. The floor is yours. Well, thanks, Lanfranco, for. Uh, for passing over and thanks to everybody that participated today as a speaker, as a great contributor, and of course also um, all our great friends in the audience. Um, it, it is one now of many, many fiber days that we have almost concluded today. And I have to say, this is maybe the one with the widest span. Uh, and it's really, really a challenge to, um, to take here uh, so many takeaways into a, into a few minutes, uh, but let me try it. Um, we started actually in a very general way um, from the health sector and the challenges and health solutions. Um, often we know that are locked in, uh, patented with healthcare providers uh, somehow sitting on their solutions, um, often not yet standardizing neither the solutions nor the data. And um, on the other side, it's becoming a business that we see to deal with data. And then we see so many other situations like access to patients data is uh, also a challenge. So where it's wanted, sometimes, uh, Lanfranco said it before, we're so conservative to publish it at all or just in a very limited way. But then we learned also from Dr. Kui Voraina that um, where it's shared and we even give our consent, uh, we don't getting, we're not really getting gratified for it. And then sometimes it's even getting shared and we don't know it. So it's it's kind of a very confusing situation. But then when you have difficult situations like COVID, um, suddenly governments, patients, hospitals, doctors, they all are in the same boat and need to find a way how to handle a situation and data and solutions are then um, highly required and need to have a fa fast access. Um, so what we can see is that the situation is not really always in the best interest of the patients. And um, I think we have all in common here the slogan that countries should strive for, um, for healthcare to be more standardized and accessible. Um, and I was uh, very happy to see what Cleveland is doing in this because what they say is they open slowly up um, they um, see the value of data and, and additional solutions um, and they um, and I like that very much they said they work like a startup going step by step learn and when they do when they fail they fail and learn from it and then take the next step and um, I think there's a lot of cities worldwide that can learn from that and at the same time also we saw from Alberto Sana what they've done in Milan um, even creating a whole city of health and welfare city, if I may say so. Um, it's maybe not completely correct to call it this way, but it goes pretty much in that direction to make sure that people that not are necessarily always patients, but citizens and obviously patients can have a better, a better welfare. Um, so what we learn is data plays a, a vital role. Um, 
Protecting patients is another really Im important thing. And this goes invo involving medical uh, research and preserving uh, the rights of patients. And of course, looking at ethical medicine as well. And at the same time, um, health research can benefit individuals. Um, for example, when it facilitates access to new therapies, uh, improved diagnostics, and uh, a lot of other more effective ways to prevent illness and deliver care. And we also saw applications today, um, different ways connected to blockchain and even not, where we can um, create a better healthcare, but also maybe support ourselves. For example, we learned that for, for kids when they need to control the diabetes issues. Also here with open data and great solutions, we can uh, really create great value. Um, but then we also learned that platforms uh, bring a big, big value. And we just, uh, we've just seen um, a solution that was built based on Fiverr by engineering um, uh, DE4 bias that was even rolled out just within a week and then obviously extended and it's still in place and actually functionality wise extended um, to really control follow up and help with the COVID situation that's um, as we can see these days uh, not over yet. So you can see the, the span was really tremendously wide um, and I'm very uh, grateful that with Fiber we can contribute, um, obviously, to a better health situation in terms of prevention, but also in terms of handling um, this period, this COVID period. And there's so much more than beyond COVID that still with open data and open platforms uh, we can support. So said that, um, I'm quite sure, Lanfranco uh, somehow already um, promised it, <laughs> we should have a follow-up um, webinar on this and I'm very sure that beginning of next year uh, we can plan on a second edition. And uh, yeah, said that, let me point out on some other things that are upcoming and I would love to ask just my colleagues to move to the next page because um, I would allow, this would allow me the next um, seconds uh, to point on a few um, news upcoming with FIWER and one is an initiative um, that's called FIWER for Health. It is a booklet, um, it's a um, compendium today showing already ready to uh, go solutions with FIWER in the healthcare sector. And obviously those that are not in yet, but do have a fiber solution in the healthcare sector, uh, please just get in contact with us. We're launching it literally just in a few hours. So it's coming right at the moment of, of this webinar. And uh, for those who know fiber even better um, and maybe seen something similar, we also launched a fiber booklet for climate. Um, uh, just actually a year ago, and it ha has today more than 30 solutions in it. So you can see there is really a lot we can do to make um, the world a little bit better with these solutions. Um, also to have a quick look still, uh, maybe the slide was already there. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Uh, to the upcoming events, I don't want to miss that. For those uh, of you who are interested, there is a Smart um, Cities Day um, just on roughly two weeks, 22nd of October. Don't miss it. It has really a lot good um, for smart cities. And there's even already planned a second edition on the 5th of November. And we will also have a look into industry, um, another uh, really sweet spot and key in this uh, key vertical of fiber, which is then on the 26th of November. Um, for those of you uh, being interested in smart city, a smart Country Convention or Intergeo. Uh, these are two other events that are not um, arranged by Fiverr, but where we participate and have also some speakers present. So you find the dates uh, of these two fairs, virtual fairs, mostly virtual fairs, also here in the in the slide set. Yeah, so that. Um, obviously, contact us, please, if you have further questions, ideas, wishes, or proposals. You find all our contacts here. Also, if you want to place a great solution in one of our booklets or onto our marketplace, uh, just raise your hand and we're happy to help you to bring you in. And with that said, that, um, I would say thank you very much for joining us today. 
Um, again, a great thanks to the media partners uh, with Business Reporter, Compass List, EU Observer, and um, Zoom Global uh, Smart Cities. And thanks, obviously, to my colleagues who made um, great arrangements here and handled everything super professionally. Uh, thanks to Charlotte Gui and, of course, to Lanfranco Marasso, to um, who, yeah, who guided us through the whole afternoon in this uh, very important uh, smart healthcare day. Thanks to everybody and back to Lanfranco. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Take care.